Well, guess what I'm talking about tonight? I saw the prop there, and I was so excited because it is the theme. I'm talking about winning the war within. We're going through the fruit of the Spirit. And, uh, you know, as I was looking at those during worship, each of those, I kind of thought that peace, you know, I like to take baths. I know some of you guys think that's kind of old-fashioned, but uh, really, I, they did studies that the most masculine men take baths. I don't know why they found that, but it made sense to me. I made that up. But anyway, it just sounds like I'd like to know that. So anyway, the, the, uh, the thing about a bath, though, it gets really difficult when the water goes out. <laughs> and so if you've, had, if you've ever taken a bath with a bad plug, it's not a great experience. And so that plug is very important. And so I was thinking of all the fruit of the Spirit, and not all of them are listed here. Uh, there is uh, one missing. It's the one that Americans don't like the most, <laughs> self-control. We actually don't allow that in the church anymore. It's just so self-centered. But uh, I thought that, you know, I can lose joy. I can lose gentleness. I can lose love. I can lose my patience. I can lose my kindness if I lose my peace. You take away my peace... So what am I guarding in my life? Oftentimes, I'm watching that peaceometer to see, you know, what's happening when challenges are coming my way. Do I still have the peace of God that goes beyond my understanding? In other words, peace, God is never frazzled. Did you guys know that? He's never frazzled. He's never pacing heaven. He's not wondering how the future is going to turn out. Uh, everything's going exactly as planned. He's excited about the future. And so if God's excited about the future, then... It's a blank word here. Blank should be excited about the future. Who is that? You. you guys. Okay. If God's excited about our future, then you should be excited about your future. If we're not excited about our future, then we're not seeing our future from God's perspective. Because the God who wrote your script, if you're following his script, again, if you're on your own, that gets really scary, okay? The way of the transgressor is hard. You're going to make your life unnecessarily hard. Life is hard. But there's purposeful pain, and then there's purposeless pain. And so a lot of folks are just self-inflicting by resisting the will of God, which is the fastest way to get to peace, the will of God. Just find the will of God, and it's the best way to live. And so I want to trust God for my future. Uh, I want to encourage you to trust God for your future. And the only way to do that is to get to know the God who's trustworthy, the one who knows your future. And if you trust him, it's going to be great. But I found it takes preparation for every season that we're in. And I think we need to know our personal seasons, our societal seasons, our global seasons, I think even geographic seasons at times. I mean, it's summer just started last Thursday. And so summer's a time to make sure your air conditioners are working, okay? Uh, get suntan lotion, that's good. So something happens in a change of a season that requires dialing in. I used to live in Lake Tahoe. We planted a church there in 74 and lived there in two different seasons for, I don't know, six years, and seven years, and I found, actually more than that, I see nine years in Lake Tahoe, uh, but we found in Tahoe that when the season changed, you had to make sure you had wood. You got to have wood, because we lived outside the city where it snowed more. Get your snowblower going, get that snowblower ready, because when it snows, it's too late to get that ready, and then when you hear a storm's coming in, you go to the store to make sure you have enough food to, to weather the storm. Uh, my wife and I did a, a number of mission trips in Guatemala and then Cuba the last few months. But in Guatemala, uh, we took this picture outside of uh, the hotel we were in. And we said, you know, what's that, that smoke coming out of that little mountain there? <laughs> and the guy said, oh, that's the Fuego volcano, which means the fire volcano. And uh, he said this kind of gingerly, yeah, two weeks ago, it rains down so much ash uh, that our city was covered with two inches of ash. Oh, that must have been fun. You know, kids sledding in ash. Uh, had ash Wednesday, ash Thursday, ash Friday. It's like, hey. And I thought, hmm, that doesn't sound, I mean, very good. The El Fuego volca volcano. And a month ago, El Fuego uh, took off and 100 people died. Uh, a volcano was active. Um, they also have a volcano. Next picture. This is the uh, aqua volcano. 
and that little babe I met down there. She's uh, <laughs> my little Latin thing there, my beautiful wife of 42 years. But uh, that's the Aqua volcano. And they told us a story. Yeah, oh, hundreds of years ago, that volcano exploded, and water came out of it, and it flooded an entire village, and a 1,000 people died. <laughs> so this town is right between two, the Fuego and the Aqua Volcano. They even have at the hotel we're staying at two ballrooms called the Fuego Ballroom and the Aqua Ballroom. So people are used to serial volcanoes that kill people. They're used to living within that. And in our lives, you know, we can get used to kind of the way things are. You know, this is, that's just the way my dad was, you know, and that's the way my family is, just the way I am. You know, I get up early in the morning, and this morning I got up, and um, because it was kind of hot, I opened the door and just kind of aired the house a little bit. And, um, you know, I just started hearing my neighbor, a rental guy next door. We are kind of in a townhouse deal. And uh, right over the fence, I had never heard him. He had never uh, made any noise there. Um, all of a sudden, he sounds like there's a lot of F-bombs coming over my fence. And so I went to the door, and, you know, my ears aren't great, so I just wanted to make sure exactly what I was hearing, not that I wanted to hear more, but uh, certainly he was. It was a lot of anger and finally yelling and um, hung up the phone. And I began to just pray for the man in earnest. I mean, this is, this is not good. I'm living next to an angry man, a man who's filled with rage, who's upset about life and cursing someone out and early in the morning, you know, tried to leave his house, maybe not to wake up his wife and kids, but I'm hearing then my wife came down and said, honey, are you outside making a phone call this morning? And I said, <laughs> not me, honey, not me. That was not me. And she couldn't hear it, of course. She, she would certainly have never identified me saying that, but, um, or at least publicly, I'm kidding. But anyway, it's a little, <laughs> just humor. So, um, but we did, you know, we prayed for the man. This is a, a big deal. But some people, there's a volcano inside, and that is a demonstration of lack of peace. And it really troubled me. It bothered me. It made me sad. It made me concerned. You know, what's going on next door? And uh, the world is certainly filled with lack of peace. And so if we're going to win the war within, it's got to start with us uh, in our lives. And so I, I just thought about the, the storms that come or the weather patterns that come in different parts of the world have to deal with things. And so here's volcanoes. We talked about that. When the fires of life melt your heart. You know, things happen in life, and all of a sudden, you know, it's not warm, fuzzy fires. It's fires that, you know, your heart's broken in a relationship. I was suicidal at one point in my life for six months because of a relationship that melted. And tornadoes, you know, when what you have is blown away, you know, recessions, financial issues, whoosh, gone. And uh, notice how the room gets quiet as you talk about different things, you know, like, ow. Earthquakes, when the world that you're sitting on is shaken. You've been in an earthquake. I've been in earthquakes in nations and various places, and man, it'll, it'll rock your world. Rocks you out of bed, and you're going, wow, this is my world. And there's no, I mean, if your ground that you're on is shaken, it affects your life. And I just would say to all of us, you know, without going to the last one even, some of us have not recovered from the fires and the winds and the earthquakes that have happened. We've not recovered, and God wants you to recover. He does, and we're going to talk about that tonight. And the last one is the hurricanes. You know, when you feel like you're drowning, um, you feel like the waters, you know, and the Bible talks about the waters came <laughs> over my soul, you know. And uh, so we have to be prepared for that. Um, I'm sure all of us know there's lack of peace in the world. I was awakened to it this morning by a man lacking peace a few feet from my house. Um, and weather conditions, I believe, can change in a minute. You know, I've seen in my own life. You know, Pastor Bob did a great job uh, a couple weeks ago talking about how, you know, the second you're at a latte line and, you know, you're doing great and the line's really long and the person's getting 20 drinks in front of you and all of a sudden that peace, you know, is gone. Um, and so winning the war within about peace, um, I think of in each of these areas, the financial storms that are coming, the relational storms that come. Um, the, and the temptations that come, you know, the winds. I want to be prepared. I am not ignorant. I don't want to be ignorant of his devices, the Bible says. 
Because the enemy is coming to rob you of your peace. The thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy. And if he can pull the plug, if he can pull the plug on your life where you lose your peace, everything else goes. Now, we either look for peace from the world's perspective, which is passing away, or the word's perspective, which will last forever. You know, the world is promising peace. The Antichrist is coming. He wouldn't be surprised if he was alive right now. He's coming, and he's going to offer peace. I mean, he's going to offer peace like, wouldn't it just be better? We don't need all these little more moral, Bible, forget that. Let's just have peace, right? Let's just have peace. And that's the way it's going to come. It's going to come offering a peace that is not what Jesus promised. And so you can either look to the world, entertainment, you know, right now. You know, I, again, I came out of the drug culture as a hip eye. My wife was a hip at. So, uh, you know, smoking dopey, we did it. I, I really got the T-shirt. And so now it's in California. It's recreational smoking dopey. Um, I understand if you got a medical issue, and I understand some of that. Okay, but recreational, just another form, a high. You know, if you have the most high, you really don't need the other high. I mean, you got the most high. Just stop right there. And if you're looking for peace from the world, it will never satisfy. I love the Johnny Cash statement that, you know, first time he did a certain drug, it was so amazing that the next thousand times he did it, he kept looking for that same high and never got it. And that's what the enemy offers. You know, God's high, if you will. And I would say that getting older, there's greater peace. I believe that. The purpose of maturity <laughs> is you know the things that would rob you of your peace and you station sentries, scriptures, convictions, values. I will not go there. Like the Bible says, don't hang around with angry men lest you learn their ways. We live in a very angry age. I don't want to listen to angry men. I don't want to hang with, hang with angry men lest I learn their ways. So I, I guard my mind, what I see, what I hear. You know, you could say you're pretty delicate. Absolutely. No question. I am a sensitive person. <laughs> I am. I feel deeply. I care Deeply, I think I again. I had a very busy day. I lay down for a nap, and I was, you know, racing. I, I was with my wife. I said, "I'm gonna." I was running to lay down for a nap. My wife knew this is not gonna happen. This is like the five-minute nap, you know. So I came down five minutes later. My mind, you know. So <laughs> my mind was way too busy to to lay down for a nap. And that wasn't bad things. It just was a lot of things on my mind. I could not just stop. But I find for me, unless I have my word to impart life to me at the beginning of my day, my day changes. I gotta have the word. I gotta wash myself with the word. Again, I wash myself with water. The Bible says, wash yourself with the water of the word. For me, I'm very grateful I was born in an age where the audio even existed way back when I was a young Christian, right? When Noah left the ark, I was there, and we had little audio. Th so back in cassettes, you guys have heard of cassettes? <laughs> we had cassettes, and Alexander Scorby, you know, this great King James orator, would read the Bible to me as a young Christian, and we had ways of playing that level of communication. That helped me, and has helped me now 46 years later. I'm still listening to the Word of God. It's on my electronics as I'm going in the car, as I'm walking, as I'm taking a bath, whatever. It's, it's on, washing over me. And otherwise, you can spend your life, you know, hoping, you know, some levels of entertainment, <laughs> some movie, some movie marathon will potentially get you there. And I will tell you, it will not. So I would say to you, number one, how to win the war of peace, guard your heart. The Bible says, guard your heart with all diligence, for out of it proceeds your life. You know, it's, it's my heart. And so I want my heart, my spirit, my, my inner man protected. I would say this. If you've never experienced God rescuing you, that means you need to be born again because you have a catastrophic sin problem. <laughs> Your sin problem is so serious, the God of the universe had to come and take the bullet for you. And if you've never gone to him, 
and allowed him to rescue you. It needs you need to be born again. Now, I would say this. If you have not gone to him recently and asked him to help you and rescue you, there's a lack of relationship between you and him because I need God every day. I don't know. Again, I, I, I could, I'll default to say that I'm probably more needy than any of you. I'll just say that. I'll just say that. I'm a needy guy. I need God all the time. I do. So if you don't need him all the time, I will guarantee you need him some of the time. And you don't have to keep up with me, but I need him all the time. And so if you don't need him all the time, it's because you're lacking a relationship with him. You're not seeing who he is and what he wants to do in your life. So all of us need that. And so Psalm 18, I just love this in the message, but me he caught. I love this. It's just like I'm, you know, it's like, falling, but me he caught. Reached all the way from sky to sea. This is a rescue mission. Again, if you don't feel you've been rescued, then you don't see what Jesus did. He rescued me. I'm still being rescued. I have been healed. I am being healed. I will be healed while there's breath in me. But he's rescuing me every day. He pulled me out of that ocean of hate. And again, in the world, it's like the world is marinating in hate. It's marinating in anger. It's marinating in people just... And, and what's going to happen is, and, and by the way, if you're a Christian and you have Christian values, you're going to be lumped in there. Your values will be called hate speech at a certain point. What you believe, moral issues, will be called hate speech. So just get ready. Our leader, what was his name? Well, Jesus was hated. He said, if they hated me, they will. That's what he said. I didn't say it. Don't, don't get down on me. But he said that. Again, millions of Christians have given their lives. I'm not saying you should be so obnoxious that people hate you. That's not what I'm saying. I'm saying that if you're the nicest person in the world, like Jesus, the nicest person in the world, they'll still kill you. Just a thought. Just meditate on that. So it says this. He pulled me out of the ocean of hate, the enemy chaos. And that's what's happening in the world right now. You know, the 24-hour news cycle of just chaos, you know, that makes its bread and butter on bad news. The badder, the better. Bad news sells. I, I learned 40 years ago to not trust the news cycle. Even then, I said, you know what? This news is processed information by people who want me to know certain things. And even though, you know, I understand if you filter it, you can find out some facts that are authentic that require action. If you're marinating on bad news, your life's going to be bad news. I think actually um, just the culture that has allowed the pervasiveness of language that is filled with anger and hate in the movies and the violence and all that, that a person who is listening to that, you know, out of, you know, what you're hearing will come out of your mouth. I mean, after a while, it just comes out. And so I'm sure I, I don't have to know what that man next door is watching I just look at what he's saying, and I can tell what he's watching. They hit me when I was down, but God stuck by me. He stood, stood me up on a wide open field. I stood there saved, surprised to be loved. And so what I would just say this, bad news focuses on man's problems. Good news focuses on God's promises. I want the same perspective about life that Jesus had. I want to focus on the things Jesus focused on. And so if I'm, if I'm reading his word every day, listening to the words of Jesus, what he's talking about, then I'll focus on the things that were on his heart. That will produce peace in me. If I'm listening, if I'm trying to determine what I should be thinking about by what the news or entertainers or musicians or movies are saying, then I will just be a cultural clone I'll become a moral zombie, and I'll just go along with the mindless culture. And again, I left that world when I left atheism, when I left uh, that counterculture movement I was a part of and became a Christ follower. I had already did what they wanted and was bankrupt. So even though they sprinkle into local and national news silver linings of stories that try and provide some kind of hope, in general, 
you know, talking about the, the nicest thing that ever happened is not going to make money for them. So they got to talk about the worst thing that ever happened. And then when you're just like, oh, you're dying, they said, and a baby was born. That's awesome. Okay. A little sprinkle of good news. But you cannot live on that. It will kill you. So the replacement for bad news, though, just can't be entertainment or distractions, you know, or a draining addiction. You know, most people are just trying to fill that peace with something. A replacement must be good news. Do, are you living on the good news of God working in your life? It, uh, do you see, let me just put it this way, do you see God doing more good things in your life than bad things? Is your future more bright than bleak? I can tell what you're focusing on by your view of the future. I can tell what you're believing by your thoughts about God. I believe that there's a God just like any good father who's capable of writing a script beyond our wildest dreams, he's the God of happy endings, he saves the best wine for last, and he wants, when, when I'm trusting him about my future, I'm excited about my future. If any of you want children who are not excited about my future, well, I try and tell my kids, don't even begin to get excited about your future. <laughs> because the world is a horrible place. Believe me, it's like, you know, Groundhog Day. It's going to be dark, and it's going to be cold, and it's going to last the rest of your life. Awesome, Dad. Thanks for sharing that with me. I really appreciate that. Make sure you tell Mom. So I want, though, the good news to be based on reality, not fantasy, you know? For me, one of my life maxims is reality is my friend. That means I'm not trying to inoculate my life experience you know, just hallelujah, praise the Lord, amen, praise the Lord, hallelujah, amen. I'm not just trying to parrot little, you know, Christian things that have no life behind them. I am ready to face whatever challenges are coming my way with a godly perspective, believing that no, though no chastening is joyous, it's grievous. Nevertheless, it yields the peaceful fruit of righteousness for those who have their senses exercised. And so I'm going to allow God to have his way, whether he's disciplining me, giving me a strong hug, whatever. It's going to produce good things. I believe that the fruit, the harvest of my trials, of my difficulties, in this world you will have tribulation, but be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. Be of good cheer. So I'm believing that. Now, Mountain Mike Shreve, a dear friend of mine who knows the mountains well, he said this once, heavy winters bring more bountiful summers. He said, Francis, do you know that the heavier the winter, the more bountiful the summer? I went, I love that. <laughs> Hit me again. <laughs> One more snowstorm. The principle is there. Now, let me say this, guys. At some point, you either have to begin to believe the word of God <laughs> Or you're going to see the same topography over and over again. If you want to see something different, begin to believe something different. If you want to see exciting futures, begin to believe that, you know what, I don't care what's happening outside. I'm excited about what's happening inside. I don't care what my present is. I'm believing for my future. And that's not wishful thinking. That's reading the Bible. That's believing the promises of God that are exceeding great and precious promises, that by these we can be partakers of a divine nature, having escaped the corruption that's in this world. God has no desire to give you peace from the storms of life. His plan is to give you peace in the storm. <laughs> We're saying, God, take the circumstance away. And God goes, I created the circumstance to make you a better person. I'm not saying always. Sometimes it could be a left hook from hell or a left right hook from heaven. It doesn't make any difference. I don't care who's doing it. I've got to respond to it. That's my role. That's my responsibility. Everything ultimately works together for the good. Even I see a headline in heaven. You know, what Satan meant for evil, God turned around for good. So don't, don't well, it's the day. No, you know, it doesn't make any difference. God makes it all work for my good. My worst experiences in life, when I was a pawn as a child, going through stuff, it doesn't make any difference. It makes me the man I am today. It gives me the convictions I have today. You take away my childhood and my good response to a hard childhood, and I become less than I am. So don't rob me of my future by not making me embrace the storms of life. 
peace that comes when the storm stops is temporary. I understand that. We all need peace from storms. I'm not saying, you know, I do like the expression, though. You know, <laughs> I know. I like the expression. Don't tell me good news. It only weakens me. It's overstated. I understand that. That's overstated. I'm just saying that, that we're, some of us are looking for so much, you know, say something nice, say something easy, make me a weak person. No. I don't want to be a weak person. The world's loaded with weak people. I'm sorry. Can I say that? Is that all right? I believe that. I don't want to be a weak person. I've been a weak person. <laughs> Hit me with a good storm. Let's rock and roll. With a good storm, let's get out of the boat. Walk on water. There was almost a little faith in this section over here. I'm telling you. Some of you guys are going, you know, say something easy. Make my life easy. Do any of you think God is going to answer your prayer when you say, make my life easy? Do you think he really wants that to happen? Again, whatever easy he's got for us comes at the right moment, and it's a selah, it's a rest. He's the God of rest. He's the God of the Sabbath. Certainly, he wants to give you rest, but he doesn't want to make you weak. Learning to have peace during the storms, that's got to be the goal. You've heard me say this over the years. And again, I, you know, I don't have an infinite number of messages to share here. So I've told you over the years that I've tried to shorten the amount of time between that left hook, the body slam, and my response to it. And I saw over the years that sometimes it took me years to get over things, then months, then weeks, then days, then hours, then minutes. And now something hits. And I'm having, right then I know this is hitting. A blow is hitting my life. And I stop, and I have to reflect. Okay, wait a second. God's in control. It may seem a little bleak right now. It seems like I'm getting creamed at this moment. <laughs> but God's going to see me through. God's faithful. Our experience, the Bible says, gives us hope. I've seen God be faithful. And then if I wait and rest and trust him, and what I'm trying to do is get it down to spontaneous. Try and get it down to Immediate. And so I have some maxims like there's no bad news in God. All things work together for the good. So those things are my protective barrier when someone or something comes at me to try and say, we're all going to die. When someone's running through the crowd saying, we're all going to die, I need, I need a statement to counteract that reality. This is all free tonight. I'm not going to charge you guys for this. This is all... <laughs> Now, I have found, for me, an undisciplined body is the breeding ground for stress, disappointment, and depression. Now, I didn't know self-control was not here. I did not know that. <laughs> but that is not a good thing. I will, it invokes, though, a story, I've got to tell you. A great pastor in our city who is now moved on to other cities where he's doing great things asked his congregation of hundreds of people, how many of you... Uh, would you write down what you believe within your family was the most predominant fruit of the Spirit? Love, joy, peace, gentleness, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, long-suffering, self-control. What fruit of the Spirit would most represent your family lineage? And he said out of the hundreds of people in his church, not one, not one said self-control. And lo and behold... So I found in my own life, self-control is a pretty important thing. I, I, I find it'll save my bacon. I love the warm, fuzzy, love, joy, peace, you know, kumbaya, marshmallows, you know, all that's <laughs> awesome. But self-control at a certain moment is exactly what I need. So I found this picture last Saturday. A week ago, my wife was going through a computer, and she found this picture on the left. And she said, honey, I found a picture of you. I said, no, 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 that's not me. That's not me. She said, that is you. Those are your grandkids behind you. That's your hat. That's your Disney hat. And then 
there was a Studley picture next to that picture. Um, I don't like either picture. They're both embarrassing, and we'll get them off the screen as soon as possible. But um, thank you so much. But even though I, neither one are flattering, let's put it that way. No one wants to look at a 70-year-old man, okay? That's just, they've done studies. There's no magazines featuring centerfolds of 70-year-old men. It's just, please don't. Grandpa, put your shirt on. <laughs> oh, gosh. <laughs> uh, it's the last days, so anything could happen right now. That's... But I would say, um, it reminds me of the blindness that we have about a certain dimension of our life that we don't think is us, but that were me. And that is not who I want to be. So the question I would say, what are the things that are robbing your peace that you would say are not you? Sorry for that noise. Number two, so how to win the battle of peace? Guide your mind. My mind is a wayward child. My mind, if I don't guide my mind, my mind will go to some goofy places. And don't just think about my mind. Just think about your mind, okay? <laughs> your mind is like, Francis, where does your mind go? It doesn't make any difference. Where does your mind go? Okay, that's the issue. You don't have my mind. You got your mind. You got your own problems. But I, this is my verse. That, I love this verse. I thought, literally, I would never get a tattoo. It's just not me, okay? But I would, I would put this on my body. You keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on you because he trusts in you. That, that is like a perfect verse. First of all, is perfect peace a goal? There goes God just exaggerating again, like, we're going to have perfect peace, you know, like your abundant life promise. That's going to happen too, right? Is God the snake oil salesman, you know, offering us perfect peace like it could happen, and you chase after your whole life never to find it? I mean, either we believe God's a man that he doesn't lie, the Bible says. Is anyone here? I, I just want, you just you know, put, put a finger up. Does anyone here believe that perfect peace is the goal? How about kind of sort of maybe peace? Little used peace that nobody else needs. You know, it depends on what you're aim whatever you're aiming at. I was talking to a guy today on the phone. And, and his aim was so loosey-goosey. I said, you're not going to hit anything because you don't have a goal that's clear. And so you're, you're kind of sort of nebulous. And, you know, what are you aiming at? Perfect peace. That's a good goal. I may not be there all the time. I know where I'm going. I'm going to perfect peace. He promises to keep me at perfect peace. If my mind is stayed on you, if I'm focused on you, Lord. Well, how do you, how do you know you're focusing on Jesus? How do you know you're focusing on God? It's in the verse there. It's a little secret, the very last line. It's trust. <laughs> you know you're trusting him. I'm sorry. You know your mind is stayed on him when you're trusting him. If you're lacking trust, you're not stayed on him. You, you know, I've said this again. Probably everything I've said, I've said before. So i got to stop saying I've said this before. I don't know many things. I can't come up with a brand new sentence, okay? Some of them are things that have just been ingrained in me. You know, try and, you know, jar a dead man. He won't even look at you. He could care less. He's dead. When you die to yourself, which the Bible asks us to do, and are alive to him, living resurrection life. No longer I that lives, but Christ who lives in me. I'm setting my affection on things above, not on things on the earth. Then that's the way to get perfect peace. I'm, don't, you, don't try and rob me of my peace. Because I'm focused on him. And how do I know? Because I'm trusting him. The Bible says be anxious for only really important things. If it's important, <laughs> it merits a little bit of anxiety. How many things should we be anxious about? Nothing. Philippians 4, 6. 
Look at this, 2 Corinthians. And this, this is kind of a news show right here. This is the nightly news. We use God's weapons, not worldly weapons, to knock down the strongholds of human reasoning and to destroy false arguments. We destroy every proud obstacle that keeps people from knowing God and capture their rebellious thoughts and teach them to obey Christ. So human reasoning, false arguments, proud obstacles, rebellious thoughts. That's what the world is offering compared to obeying Christ, trusting his word. And so here's a, a little slide here. Are you at peace with your life? True peace only comes from one person, God himself, the Prince of Peace. Scripture says, while people are saying there is peace and security, and again, this is what's going to be offered, guys. There, there will be people, there'll be an antichrist. One day he'll come who will offer peace, safety. I know you'll lose a little bit of your own freedom and, you know, moral, it doesn't make any difference. Peace and safety will be the main event. I do believe the Antichrist will talk about Jesus. He'll be lumped in there, some kind of generic Jesus, just, just like the day I got saved. When my friend offered me Jesus, I said, I believe in Jesus. He said, no, no, just Jesus, Francis. It's not like throwing him in like he's garnish on the plate there. There is peace and security, then sudden destruction will come upon them. In fact, peace, this is a great verse here, with a peace without holiness, the holiness of Christ will lead to appeasement without principle. The Bible tells us, pursue peace with all people. How many people? Is there anyone we should not pursue peace with? Pursue peace with all people. With holiness. I'm not going to give away, I'm not going to give away my character hanging with somebody, my integrity, who I am as a person. Without that peace and holiness, you're not going to see the Lord move. In your life, if we give away our peace or give away our holiness, we're not going to see God move in our lives. So the moral compass of our culture is saturated with lies and deception, nothing eternal, only temporary. Man's values are worthless. And the Bible says, proclaiming themselves wise, they become fools. What did Jesus say? John 14, we're almost done here. Peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you, not as the world gives. He knows the world's offering peace. And then he says this. This is now a commission, this sentence. This is something what we are responsible to do. This is something we are capable of doing. He said, let not your heart be troubled. You are responsible to not let your heart be troubled. I am the keeper of my heart. I am guarding my heart. I refuse to let my heart be troubled. That's what Jesus told me to do. And I will also refuse to be afraid. I will not bow to fear. I will not believe my future is bleak. Now, what do you want to tell me? That's how I live. That's the filter for my life. Number three, how to win the battle? Watch your mouth. The Bible says death and life are in the power of the tongue. I'll just say this too. Another minefield is the social mediums. I mean, it's snorkeling in a septic tank. And there's people... I, I don't look at a lot of what people are saying because I don't want to just hang with people that would fill my mind with negativity. Someone, I was with someone recently, a, a pastor, and um, just to kind of show me, I said I don't really look at what's other people, the negativity, that the, the bombs that people are throwing at one another, the, the, the anger that's being, and he said, well, look at this. And I said, I don't want to look at it. He goes, look at it. I don't, I don't want to look at it. And then, then he just decided to read it to me anyway. <laughs> and when I heard it, honestly, I, was, I, I, just, I, didn't want, I didn't want to hear that. I don't want to think that about that person. I don't want to believe that person would say something like that. That's a weak moment in that person's life. He made a foolish sentence right there. And I wish he hadn't have said that. And maybe tomorrow morning he'll wake up and wish he hadn't have said it. And now it's on the internet. I'm just saying. Watch your mouth. Watch what comes out of your mouth. Uh, Jesus said, what you say flows out of your heart. Havila, my daughters. My daughters are, are wonderful. And Havila, she said to me a few weeks ago, I was having difficulty 
going to do something. I just was talking to her. I was on my schedule, and she said, I just heard this, Dad. I heard that if you say, and this was a, is a, a lighthearted sentence. She said, if you say something five times, like, I'm looking forward to doing this, and I'm looking forward to doing this, and I'm looking forward to doing this. I'm not talk, I'm talking about a good thing, but you're just not looking forward to it. He said, if you say it five times, it kind of triggers your mind. I'm looking forward. I was going on a long hike. I'll just put it that way. And I, I had a great time, but I just at that moment was not excited about climbing mountains and doing all that. But I, I did hear, I'm looking forward, I, and I heard that somehow it begins to speak to your heart. You speak those words. And yet on the opposite side, James says this, it only takes a, a spark, remember, to set off a forest fire. A careless or wrongly placed word out of your mouth can do that. By our speech, we can ruin the world, turn harmony into chaos. Is harmony really the goal anymore? I'm like a unity guy. I'm like a harmony guy. I am. I'm a John 17 guy. I am. Call me naive. Call me idealistic. Jesus said that John 17, that they may be one as we are one. As the Godhead is one and the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, that unity he wants in the body of Christ. I'm in pursuit of that. So I want harmony and not chaos. Throw mud on my reputation. Throw mud on a reputation. Send the whole world up in smoke and go up in smoke with it. Smoke right from the pit of hell. This is the age for us to guard what comes out of our mouth, what we put in writing, what you look at, and what you say in reaction to what you look at. I mean, you can look at something that's going to bring out the worst in you. Or you can look at something that's going to bring out the best in you. Last point, don't forget who you are. This is a big deal. Who are you? I was sitting with four very close African-American brothers in a restaurant a few months ago. And I was just struggling. And we were all kind of struggling together just with the challenges going on. And one of them, a dear friend, Sam Starks, head of the MLK March here, Dear friend, I love him much. He's like a twin because we think alike at different points. And he looked at us and he said, brothers, don't forget who you are. Don't forget who you are. And it had that, that impact in my heart. And I, I was forgetting. He was saying it because there was a little wobbliness in that. And it, it, it redialed me back in. I remember who I am. What is the call of my life? I'm not here to please anybody else. I'm not here to follow anyone else's will for my life. There's one person who's already established his will for my life, and his will is better than your thoughts about your, your will for my life. I like his will for my life. That's what I'm in pursuit of. But I've got to know my assignment. The most, you're looking for peace? The most peaceful place you could ever go and live is God's will. You're looking for peace? Just find his will. It's the center of the storm. It's, it's the, the middle of that hurricane. And um, one little story about my wife. My wife, you know, as an evangelist, that was my first ministry. But evangelist wife, you know, they played the piano. They sang. They led women's ministry. You know, they preached themselves. And my wife had no interest in any of those things. But there was vibes back at that point in the early innings. You know, we're talking a long time ago where that was kind of expected. But I realized early on my wife's desire was to raise children. That was her sweet spot. She's a savant. When it comes to raising children, she is a savant. She has an un understanding that's extraordinary. And so I realized, and again, I only realized after I tried to get her to do other things that she didn't want to do. <laughs> this is after me saying, honey, wouldn't you like to speak? And wouldn't you like to? Wouldn't? No, I wouldn't. Actually, I wouldn't. But I wouldn't. Thank you for offering. So... I let her be her, and she, by the grace of God, she was the principal one that raised two magnificent girls, and now we're endeavoring to raise some grandkids. And so she finding her assignment brought peace. My question is, what is your assignment? What is your sweet spot? What is the battle that goes on? Look what Jesus said. Now my soul is troubled. Again, the Garden of Gethsemane. Should I pray, Father, save me from this hour? But this is the very reason I came. Wait a second. Stop this storm. And God goes, the storm's going to make you the man I've called you to be. I want to learn that what I'm going through is actually going to produce in me the best if I'll trust God in my life. And I think I'm done. Let's all stand together. I'm going to sign books on the way out, giving away free books in the lobby. And 
I'd love to be able to give you a book, whether you get it signed or not. It'll decrease the value. If you get it signed, it'll just lose some value because you could have given it to someone. But, but I just want to pray for, for you to have peace. You know, as you can tell, I fight for my peace. We are wrestling. The Bible says we are wrestling. All of us are wrestling against every thought, every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God and bringing every thought into captivity. I'm wrestling, casting down imaginations, rejecting lies, wading through, see what is the truth, what's reality, what's going to bring peace. And what I, what I would say to you, let the, when the Bible says, let the peace of God rule in your heart, if what I'm doing is not producing peace, I will leave it. Someone, you know, text me, I think either today or yesterday, you know, asking me what I was doing about something, which was not meant to encourage me. It was kind of meant to rub my nose in something, they're not a Christian, rub my nose in something that they sh thought I should be doing. And so I, I know what the devil thinks. He's trying to get me off track. He's trying to get me discouraged because I'm not doing what other people want me to do when I want to do what God wants me to do. Let's close our eyes for a moment. God, we trust you, and we desire perfect peace. Therefore, we're going to let our mind, our hearts be stayed on you, resting in you. We believe our future is bright because you wrote the script. We believe, Lord, that the call on our life is exactly who and what we are called to be and do. And we know that we will not ace that. We know that no one masters the fork or running or anything. It requires stepping up. And a just man falls seven times, but he gets up. He's in pursuit. And so we are in pursuit of you, Lord. We're in pursuit of your will for our lives. And, and we believe that your grace is sufficient to make up that difference for our lack, Lord. What we don't have, your grace not that we are sufficient of ourselves, that in our, in our weakness, you're going to be made strong. So I pray the grace that is needed across this room for the storms, the tornadoes, the volcanoes, the hurricanes that are going on, the earthquakes that are happening in people's lives, that we would trust you right in the middle of our storm, of our difficulty, that it's going to work for our good. It's going to produce good things in us that you will see us through, that you will be our guide, even unto death, Lord. I pray that each one of us would look forward to our future, that we believe, God, that your promises are better than the world's problems, that we'd focus on good news, the good news of your plan for us and not marinate on the bad news of discouragement, not believe for the things the world offers, but the promises the word offers. Help us to have our minds renewed, our hearts renewed, refreshed. But we believe in you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus, for dying for our sins, for rising from the dead, for giving us everlasting life. We are in pursuit of you, God. Thank you for pursuing us long before we pursued you. But we bless you tonight, Lord. I bless each person. Just lift your hands with me tonight. Father, we reach out to you. We reach out for your best. We reach out believing. We believe you're good. We believe you are able. We believe that he who has called us is faithful, who also will do it. That whatever you've called us to be and do, you're going to give us the grace to be and do that. We will not look back on our lives with regret. We will not look back feeling shortchanged. We are going to look back saying, God, you promised to do exceedingly, abundantly, above and beyond all we could ask or think. And because we trusted you, that is our life. God, I desire on my deathbed to be staring into eternity with anticipation and excitement. I want to have grown in my relationship with you on this earth to believe, to see. Even as David said, I would have lost heart if I had not believed to see the goodness of the Lord. And so, Lord, before we see, we're going to believe. Faith is that substance of things we're hoping for. It's the evidence of things we can't see yet. But we believe in it, Lord. We are believing in it, Lord. We believe your promises. We believe your word. And we trust you. We rest in you. We honor you tonight, Lord. Bless your people, Lord.
Let faith rise in our hearts, God. And when the, when the things come to rob our peace, let us walk past them. Let us move past them. They're not meant for us. We walk in your peace. You can give us peace in a storm, but we've got to know it's you that has guide us, guided us into that storm. And we'll trust you in that moment. In Jesus' name, everyone said amen. Give God a hand. Amen. All right. God bless you guys.